Hey, this is Brighter Rays, and uh, this week we're looking at a study called God on My Side, and we're in Genesis chapter 31, and today we're looking at verses 26 through 30. And we got in this section Laban's lecture here. Now Laban and his kinsmen make their way to Jacob's tent, and you know Laban is not going to leave without first scolding Jacob. Laban has a four-part lecture prepared for his son-in-law. First point, you tricked me. This is his first complaint. You tricked me. You didn't tell me you were leaving. The root word for tricked here is to steal. As we might say in English, you have stolen away from me. You snuck away and you treated my daughters like captives of the sword, he says. Clearly Laban did not know how his daughters felt, you know, how they really felt about him. They were, <laughs> they, they were not there against his will or against their will, right? He, he's he's speaking as if you know. Jacob led uh, Rachel and Leo away by you know by sword, like he's forcing them to go. That's what he's saying. But we already heard their side of it. They're like, yes, do whatever God wants you to do. You know, our father. There's no there's no point of us being here. We're out of the inheritance. The you know. We're out of everything. He treats us like foreigners here. So why would we stay? Let's go. So they're not there against their will. They want to go. As God said to do it, let's do it. So, you know, they felt as if they were goods to be traded. They were just child to him. They were just things to get ahead. They were ready to leave him behind. They, they were okay with that. Now, the second point is that Laban says that Jacob was a fool. Now, Laban suggests that <clears throat> Jacob didn't need to run away like he did because they would have thrown a party for him on his departure, right? There would have been mirth and tambourines and all this kind of stuff. There would have been a party. He would have known he was leaving, you know, there. And if he would have known, he would have created a feast. They would have had a good old time. Laban complains that he didn't even get a chance to kiss his family goodbye. So Jacob robbed him of, of Laban's, you know, robbed him of his chance to say goodbye, bless his family. So all of a sudden, you know, Laban has become, you know, father of the year. Oh, oh, you robbed me. All I wanted to do was kiss them goodbye, he says. All I wanted to do was just say goodbye. And you stole that from me. What is Laban doing here? This is clearly a guilt trip, right? He is laying it on thick and, uh, you know, but we see that Jacob does not respond. You know, he doesn't respond like, oh, what are you talking about? He doesn't get up in his face and start complaining right away. He lets Laban say his piece, which is amazing. I mean, Jacob, I mean, he's learned patience over these last 20 years of the story. <clears throat> it's very clear that that's the case because, I mean, he's just letting Laban say these things, which are truly not true, you know. Yes, he did sneak away, but there's a good reason because last time he tried to get away, he was like, oh, wait a minute, uh, let's make a deal here. Let's... And he knew that Laban would harm him. And, um, and he's right, you know? So what do you do if you're trying to get away? You know someone's going to try to kill you or at least do some serious damage to you. Um, are you going to say, hey, uh, I know you want to kill me. But I'm going to be going over here uh, just so you know. You know, so <clears throat> we talked to about last week about the morality of him sneaking away, of him tricking. Was it right or wrong? And uh, commentators kind of go both ways. You know, it was wrong for Jacob to sneak away. It was, he should have told Laban. On the other hand, you know, if he tried to get away, he probably wouldn't have gotten away. So, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting debate. That's one of those ones that you talk about, you know, in... In Bible college, like here, here's the scenario. You know, <laughs> if you're going to be killed by someone, do you have do you have to tell them that you're leaving? <clears throat> so, but in a Laban hears or Laban delivers this part of his lecture, and Jacob doesn't respond. Uh, so he goes with another tactic. He says, "I could hurt you." So this is what we really come down to here, right? Laban says, I have the power to do you harm. Oh, really? This is obvious <laughs> since he showed up with a bunch of guys who were probably all armed, right? He's, he's not, he didn't march in with his family. He found the young men. He found the men that could fight. And so he gathers them together, and that's why he's coming after. So he says that 
You know, I had the power here. I got the men here to do you some harm. We could, we could mess you up. So, you know, and it's funny because if he just wanted to say goodbye, why show up with all the kinsmen, <laughs> right? It seems as if Laban is saying that he would have heard him, except God said that he couldn't. <laughs> That's what he says. Laban said, uh, you know, the God of your father, which is a telling statement, not our God, but your father's God stopped me from attacking you. So that was his plan. He gathered his men together. He gathered his kinsmen, probably, you know, I don't know if he brought his sons with him, but at least the other men in his household. And they came wanting to do harm. So, I mean, I think that's what Jacob was saying earlier to his wives, too. Like, you know, he's not being too favorable. You know, he's turned, he's turned his face away from me. He's against me now. He wants to do me harm. If, if we leave here, you know, we need to be prepared for that. So, Jacob knew that, he was, that Laban was against him. There's problems going on. Laban comes out with basically a small army and, um, you know, there's, there was going to be trouble if God had not stopped him, it says. The God of your father, <laughs> not, says, not, you know, God, my, our God said that we, I shouldn't attack you. He says, no, the God of your father, which is a very interesting explanation, a very interesting um, description of what happens. The next point, he says to Jacob, you're a thief. Here we go. Finally, we get to the main reason, I think. Laban is out in Gilead, right? It's not because he wants to say goodbye to his family. It's because something's been stolen. He's missing his household gods. His little idols are gone. They've been stolen. And since they disappeared at the same time, Jacob leaves. He assumes Jacob has stolen his teraphim. Of course, we already know that Rachel has stolen them. But Jacob doesn't know this. Jacob is is uh, innocent of it he is not aware that this has happened either and uh, which we'll see in a minute so you know but jake or laban's like they stole my household gods i gotta go back and so i think that's really why he's out there i mean the the whole thing i mean that's why he goes right because he's armed he's gonna go back go back and get his goods i mean the the his family is probably secondary on his list now he might want to bring his family back just to steal him away from Jacob. But I think the priority here is, as we've seen, he's about money and wealth. I think the priority here is his household gods. So, you know, Laban is an idol worshiper and not a follower of God. Many years later, Joshua will remind the nation of Israel that they came from idol worshipers in Mesopotamia and warn them not to follow them. This is kind of contradictory reasoning that comes from one that does not follow God, right? This is the, the debased mind and futile and fruitless thinking of one that does not acknowledge God and give him, give him thanks. Like, you've got, you got these little gods that someone can steal. So, and we'll talk about a little bit, like, in the next, in the end of, of this story, we'll see a little bit more. And I think we really need to take pity on Laban because he's messed up. <laughs> he's got the one true God talking to him. But yet, he's still so concerned about his little household gods. It's sad. But, I mean, that's the, the state of humanity, right? So many people know about God, know about Jesus Christ, know about salvation. And yet, they have their household gods. They have their little idols set up that people can steal and destroy. And it's so sad because they devote so much time and energy into these little idols. But, um, you know, the one true God is there. And he's spoken to him through his word. You can have God's word right in your hand. But people want the idols. They want the little gods that someone else can go and steal. Or if your house burns down, there goes your idols. So that is human nature. Laban is very human. He's, he's a, worldly, a worldly man. And uh, fits right in with the description. And nothing has changed. You know, Even though they're riding on camels and living in tents, you know, that translate directly into people today. It's so applicable to humanity today, um, creating their little idols, you know, and they've always been about themselves and about wealth, about power. Hey, I could harm you, dude. I could do that to you. Oh, really? God told you you couldn't do anything. <laughs> so, no, you couldn't do that. But 
That's what people think. And even after they're told by God themselves, still think they can do it. So there's there's a definite lesson in there. Different, definitely a, a description of humanity that we need to learn right there. And that's who people are. And uh, nothing's changed in all these centuries. So come back next time and we'll take a look at uh, Jacob's rebuttal to Laban's lecture.